morning to everyone. We've, uh, we've already been having quite a bit of fun, so uh, we hope to pass that all on to you. Uh, we certainly think that this sports roundtable is going to be a very unique uh, opportunity for you guys. Now, I steal a line from Star Trek. Space, the final frontier. Sports, the final frontier for disposable content. I mean, one, it's just not as valuable as a commodity. Once the games are over, you know who's won or lost or how many fantasy points you've, you've won. <laughs> so it's certainly a unique opportunity for sports and technology to meld. And if you look at the fan experience, I, I came across some numbers. The proof is there. According to our friends at Octagon, over 50% of the fans watching a live sporting event on television are using their mobile device to supplement their experience. And if you're at the game, that number jumps to 75%. So there's so much going on intersecting sports and the mobile industry. We have, I think, the best panel of the whole week to talk about these issues in sports. Start off with, well, you're, you're laughing already, am I? Uh, too much hyperbole for you, John? Come on. John Kozner is the Executive Vice President for Digital and Print Media at ESPN. I was amused to learn that when he was a little kid, he memorized the New York City subway map, which of course would not be necessary today because he would have his mobile app. <laughs> but speaking of mobile apps, John, you actually just got back from Cupertino. So with the whole Apple unveiling, what did you find particularly in the sports industry, the sports medium? So first of all, good morning, everybody. Andrea, it's a privilege to be on the panel with you. You exemplify excellence in our industry. Thank you. That, that's just how I wrote it. Thank you. <laughs> the, um, the Apple presentation was very, very interesting. When you think about the new Apple Watch, at least two key facets. One, highly personalized device. Mm -hmm. Second, it's always on. Sports as an industry, always on. ESPN as a media company, always on you can immediately see the possibility of scores, news, notifications. So that's just getting started. Thank you, and we welcome to you. Colin Smith is the managing director for NASCAR Digital Media. In looking for a little tidbit on him, I found out that he plays guitar in a band called Rhymes with Orange. If you can figure it out, good luck to you. What he does know about is connectivity. Now, I know there's been a lot of talk about the connected car this week. Who better to talk about the connected car than the NASCAR maven? What does that mean to you, Colin, and welcome? Well, first of all, we're, our band is not very good, so we try to disguise that <laughs> humor, which does not work very well either, because people usually come to listen to music, not hear jokes. But uh, the connected car for us is, is really the future of where our sport is going. Um, the car itself, many people don't know this, the, the, the NASCAR car, the race car itself, is a very connected um, uh, device. It's got sensors we, tra uh, we track, multiple data points. We have in-car audio, we have in-car camera, and what we're trying to do is figure out the best way to take all that information and create consumer-facing applications with it. So as um, the world of the Fords and the Chevys and the Toyotas that all participate in our sport, uh, as they continue to advance technology in their cars, their passenger cars, their trucks, we're actually big beneficiaries of that because we're using that same technology in our cars to make sure that we're transmitting that information out to the fans. So big, big step for us moving forward for sure. Okay. Our next panelist is kind of like Madonna. He only needs one name, Emmett. The NFL's Do I, need, do I need to remind you, the NFL's all-time leading rusher, three-time Super Bowl champion, Hall of Famer, and, oh, by the way, champion on Dancing with the Stars. Yes. <laughs> but, but and, I, and look, and I've known and covered Emmett his entire career, and as great a, a professional as he is, he's even better a person. But the thing that I really admire is the way that he has made a virtual, seamless transition to life after football. As a businessman, as an entrepreneur, real estate, construction, uh, technology, and he started a company called Prova, which is all about mobile authentic authentication. Can I get that out right? Yes. What do you think? You it's got 9 it o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and, and it uses technology to validate sports memorabilia. So where did you ever come up with the idea to found and start Prova? Well, 
in the, in the sports world, uh, oftentimes we go out and do autograph sessions and so forth, and fans like to collect items that are from some of their local heroes and some of their team heroes and so on. What I found was that in doing such, there is a lot of fraudulent activity that takes place in the sports memorabilia collectible space. And so what I've always wanted to do was to make sure or ensure that our fan, the fan that was my fan or any fan was getting the, the most available, most legit item that they can possibly receive. And so in doing so with the mobile technology that we use over at Prova, we, all, we started using NFC technology. We utilized RFID technology back in 2002, back when I was going to break the record. And what I found was being able to identify the individual item and what transpired in that item and make that item readily available for the consumer who wants it and to give them a, a, a trusted source for authentication is really what we were after. And now that the mobile technology has caught up to it, here we can connect the, both of these things and add more content and more user experience from that perspective. All right. A lesser man could not follow Emmett Smith. But Simon Wardle is not just a lesser man. He is the <laughs> chief strategy officer for Octagon. And as good as Emmett was, and all these gentlemen are in there, he is the research guy when it comes to fan behavior. He has created something called passion drivers, passion shift re research. Of course, it made me wonder what he's a fan of, and it's the EPL West Brom, who I understand they were great in the 90s, the problem is it was the 1890s. So you know, maybe you, I, I do applaud you for being, for being such a fan, but from all your research, yes. how have you found that mobile technology has affected the fan experience? Um, well, when you think about the intersection of sport and mobility, um, where we have come over the last 10 years is amazing. And as Octagon, we've been on a fascinating ride with the folks from NASCAR, because Nextel and now Sprint is a client of ours. And back in 2004, when we assumed the title sponsorship of the NASCAR Cup Series, uh, this was the state of mobile technology back in the day. Let me reassure you, <laughs> this was state of the art in 2004. Does anyone have one of these? Anyone? Oh, we got one hand back there. On you, is, does it work? <laughs> so yeah, 2004, we've come a long way. Uh, because if you're watching the race in 2004, you could call your fellow fan on this. And if they called you, you could have a second screen experience. Because right here, it's called caller ID. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, we went to quite elaborate lengths back in the day to build a connection between mobility and sport. Because this wasn't really an endemic category at the time. Technology was starting to come on board, and I think that's one of the reasons why, Next, uh, why NASCAR was so excited to partner with Nextel, a technology company. But it was a little bit of a force fit. And you know, here we are 10 years later, and this was, I should mention, this was a smartphone back in the day, because this had push-to-talk technology. So it wasn't just a phone. It was a walkie-talkie as well. Now we are in the world of smartphones, and these things are, from a sports perspective, fan command central. Through ESPN, we can stream video content, we can surf uh, the web, mobile apps. This has redefined the sports fan experience. We still have television that broadcasts the events and uh, aggregates millions of viewers. But now everyone can supplement and feed their passion in a personalized way that can deliver, through this device, the ultimate fan experience for you as an individual. And, and to me, that's really been the impact of technology. And you now the research that we've conducted, uh, we've looked at, we looked at 12 sports this year, mapping out all of the different ways in which fans consume technology. And this truly has reinvented the fan experience. And I would argue that at this point, we're not forcing a fit. This is more endemic to the sports experience than Under Armour or Gatorade. This, this, that, that's important to guys like Emmett, who, you know, the dozens of people on the field. This is important to the millions of people who are consuming sports, so. But you don't have to worry about me. I'm no longer on the field, so. <laughs> Me neither. If you, compare, um, <laughs> if you compare the six plus 
to the Dale Earnhardt phone, that screen is about 10 times bigger mm. in 10 years. So, so much is possible now. I'm glad you knew that was Dale Earnhardt phone. That's pretty good. <laughs> junior. We love all sports. That's the junior eight, yes, thank you. I, will, I want you to know that you are not the only person that can play show and tell. I too can play show and tell. And now, one, something that uh, came up for me that I found amazing, global counterfeiting is expected to cost consumers 1.7 trillion, that's a T, 1.7 trillion dollars in 2015. What does this ball possibly have to do with global counterfeiting? First of all, this is my opportunity to hand off to a Hall of Famer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm, I'm a lefty, I'm a lefty, so if I'm... Must I stand? Well... Make sure you get it in the gut. Yeah. High and tight, baby, just keep it high and tight, keep it high and tight. There you go. Oh, okay. All right, what, what is the significance, though, of, of, this, of this football when it does come to Prova and when it comes to, to counterfeit? Well, when it comes down to authentication and verification, uh, for years the consumer never had an opportunity to actually go and buy a product and really entrust themselves with the person that's selling them the product. They had no way of grabbing any kind of content from the item that they were purchasing. Through this technology, NFC technology, we have inserted a, a smart tag inside of the football. And now once the football is issued out to a respected team, uh, it actually hits the field. And we're able to track what happens on the field in terms of the, the series that the ball is in and whether or not someone scored a touchdown. And then we're able to go back behind the scenes and grab the data, the video data, the statistical data, and associate all of that to the football. So now once they hit the store or this memorabilia shop that some person want to go and collect, if they have the mobile device with our app on it, they can scan this ball, pull up the content, and be able to verify its authenticity, which also ensures if you're going to pay $1,400 for something, make sure that it's real. And that's the whole purpose of, of what we're trying to do with Provo. Thank you. Well, don't, oh, don't, don't be fumbling, don't fumbling it now. <laughs> right, but so from, from technology and footballs to wearable technology. What are, your, what are your guys' thoughts on this? Whether it's sensors, whether it's, and, and, and we could be talking about things for the benefit of health and safety of players. It could be for the average person who wants to monitor uh, their own fitness. What, what, is, what does this industry look like? Yeah, so um, we are actually going to be most likely next year outfitting all of our drivers with, with biometric you know, sensor technology. So we can not only track um, their health within the car, but obviously communicate that out to either fans, to our race control officials, to healthcare officials. So we just had an incident last week where Jimmy Johnson, literally very dehydrated, had to be pulled out of the car. And luckily that happened towards the end of the race. If that happened in the middle of the race, I mean, these guys are, these guys are not getting out of their cars. I mean, they are there to win and, and they're going to have to be pulled out of their car. So if there is a health issue and we don't know it and they're not telling us, then you know, this technology will, will absolutely help us. It also, when you talk about the personalized experience, I mean, our fans have these unbelievable connections with these drivers and they just want to know everything about these drivers. And if you can know what Jimmy Johnson's heart rate is going into turn four at Daytona, they want to know that information. So if we can actually make a consumer facing application out of that and provide it to the fans, it just helps with our connection to the fan base and creating a better fan experience. So Now, now this may be TMI, too much information at uh, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, but we were talking earlier. You, you know what's coming. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, was just, I was telling the guys earlier, as Emmett well knows, in sports for professional athletes, <laughs> football players in particular, dehydration is a huge issue. Here's what they do in 2014. There's a chart in the locker room next to the loo, and it's got a list. It's, it shows you if your urine is this color, then you're probably dehydrated. In this day and age of technology, this is what, what exists. I mean, there's got to be something better. I mean, how could technology help the health issues that are involved with, with players? Just taking some of the same thing that we've been discussing, and if you take these uh, sensors and be able to gather biometrics from a player in the course of a football game, you're able to determine whether or not in the first, second, or third quarter what type of hydrated body this person actually have. Mm -hmm. And you're also able to tell 
whether or not this person is bruised, if you can go that far. I think the sensory aspect of, of, of being able to put it on an athlete's body will help LeBron James out <laughs> in, in, in a very important game. So it, they will be able to determine whether, whether LeBron, your levels are getting too low. So let's get you hydrated. Let's come in and give you an IV before the half so you can finish the second half as well. Those are some of the things that can take place if this information was readily available. It's changing the way sports are played. San Antonio Spurs won the NBA championship with none of their star players playing over 30 minutes a game. Mm -hmm. That's a, totally against the way, the way you used to apportion minutes. Mm -hmm. In our case, use Nate Silver and 538.com as an example. You have a whole genre of content now created literally around the analytics, sensors, mm -hmm. data journalism, whole new field. And, and it, you know, I think it goes back to the, the earlier question about how has technology reinvented the fan experience or the sports experience and the data that this technology is generating is create, opening new fields of analytics and you know, it's, it's even impacting, as, as, as John said, what's happening on the field and uh, it's all because of mo mobile technology. And what about the development of various apps, whether it's for the fan experience or just to make things easier if you're in a stadium and you have digital ticketing or something like that, or, or personalization. I mean, I know that NFL Now was launched, obviously at ESPN there's a number of things. What, what, are, what are the apps that, that are out there that are really, uh, really enhancing things in the sports area? Well, as you guys have discussed, mobile is now the main event. It's turned everything upside down. So your experience really starts with an app or an app-like experience. And fans use these all day long. So it really puts a, a priority on speed, on really elegant user interface, on better understanding what people are coming and looking for. And then similar to what, say, Netflix does, having an application that gets smarter for you as you use it more, it has really changed things utterly. This past Sunday, first Sunday of the NFL season, biggest day in our history. We had 25 million daily active users. Mobile uniques were up 50% year over year. And that was a big number a year ago. It was up 50%. Fantasy football application up 73% year over year. And again, we don't start at a small level, so these are <laughs> seismic mm -hmm. shifts. And we think it's terrific. It delivers a much better experience for reasons that Simon laid out. There's so many more things that we can do, but it is changing the nature of content. It's changing the nature of the fans' expectation. When you attend an NFL game now, when you go there live, you want to have everything there and more because we've trained you to expect so much from your mobile device itself. I think with the, additional, with the addition of NFC devices now, um, the mobile wallet, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, the lines when people are in line to get food and so forth can be cut down now because you can grab your food and actually pay with your mobile wallet and they keep on moving so they can rotate you in and out fairly quickly. Can't you quicker. actually find where's the shortest line to the bathroom yeah. or the shortest you might line be able to get to do beer? Those I think you can actually well. do things like that yeah. now. Well, it's more than that. I mean, there are innovative companies now at NFL stadiums where they recognize who you are. They offer you, would you like to stand on the <laughs> sidelines at the, at, the, at the Seahawks game? That will cost you something extra, but it's a chance to take advantage. Would you like a better seat? There are so many, there are so many ways to improve the experience. I'm sure this is the case at the racetracks. Yeah, there's, there's really nothing that, that kind of comes through our halls where, where mobile is not contemplated, whether it's, you know, the, the fan experience at the track, uh, at track retail. Um, but for, for the digital group, you know, our, our mobile traffic is up 40% year over year. And, I mean, it's just happening. I mean, you cannot stop it from happening. So you better be prepared to, you know, gravitate towards those channels and provide them with a great, you know, mobile optimized user experience. Right. So our, our race view mobile app, which is our real live 3D virtualized race that we can um, provide to the fans on Sunday, I mean, that's changing the way our younger demographics interface with the sport. You know, they want to see a 3D virtual environment because it's very game-like. It's built on a Unity platform, which built, you know, which a lot of mobile app, uh, mobile gaming apps are built off of. So now they're experiencing NASCAR almost like a game that they're seeing on their iPad, and they love it. And so now we're gravitating towards how do we create more unique experiences like that for the younger generation of fans. 
I want to get to games in a second, but and you might have, have something on this. I don't know if this exists in NASCAR, but in the National Football League, one of the issues that you have is that the product on television is so good. It's so strong. You can see so much. The replays, and you, it, it, it's, it's, it's the quintessential television game, but you still want to get people out to the stadium. So you, all you hear about is enhancing the fan experience in the stadium. How does technology work in that vein? I, I think in many ways it replicates some of the fantastic features that the NFL Network and ESPN are building into those TV experiences. So you now have your mobile app, so you can sit you know, in your bleacher seat and see percentages of you know, what does this guy hit against the left-hander? And you can create your own added value experience and almost the ultimate TV show for yourself and get to experience the whole in-stadium uh, experience as well. So it, the, the flexibility of the tool to deliver exactly the type of information that you want to supplement your fan experience and add value to that ballpark experience is you have it in your hand, and as I said earlier, it's just completely reinvented the sports experience. Andrea, the NFL is starting to put sensors on guys' shoulder pads mm -hmm. and trying to monitor where they are on the football field, mm -hmm. you know, whether or not they're in a pile and all those kind of things, what route are they running, they're going to try to come back and mimic that through some type of uh, graph. That is something that the NFL is doing right now, and that that technology will probably reach your mobile phone and you'll be able to see the route that the actual player actually mm -hmm. ran. Mm -hmm. But also, what we think about as pro, but once we secure all of the, the articles that would touch that football field, whether it's a football, whether it's a helmet, jersey, pants, shoes, whatever it may be, we feel that the fan experience would change dynamically. It would give us a chance to have what we call our live auction. Mm. And for fantasy football lovers, mm. if you're sitting in the stands and you're watching Adrian Peterson rush for over 200 some yards, you may want his uniform. Why not auction off his uniform right before your eyes and get and command top dollar? That's the way we look at it. The um, kind of the gem of, of our world is Daytona International Speedway, and they're going through a project now called Daytona Rising, which is a $400 million complete renovation of the entire facility. It's a 480 acre facility or something like that. And one of the primary reasons is to update the technology within the stadium or within the track to make sure that they are providing a good fan experience and that everybody is connected. We have social viewing areas, you know, built directly into the track now, which, you know, something that has never been done in the world of NASCAR, so. If you think what's really intriguing though, looking out is that we could combine both. As a fan, as a personalized fan, we could offer you wonderful things at home and increasingly take you into the venue as well. At the World Cup, which was just a defining event for ESPN, and probably put live streaming on mobile devices on the map, we started all, every live broadcast two hours before the event. And if you chose to watch the streams, you could see the teams, you could see the helicopters following the teams to the venue. You could see the players uh, behind the scenes, you know, marching onto the field with the children. It was very, very moving, and it sort of heralds in what's coming, which is you can be in your living room but feel like you're at Cowboy Stadium. More and more of that is coming. Mobile is going to make that possible. Well, AT&T might get upset, though. <laughs> if you go to Cowboy Stadium, AT&T might get upset. Because I didn't call it AT&T. <laughs> <laughs> you have to put a dollar in the jar. You know, look, we, we know in, in sports, perhaps not unlike other industries, there's always a copycat factor. You know, when you had the yellow line that first came out when you're watching television by one network, everybody picked it up. So when it comes to the World Cup, and you talked about how unprecedented it was, plus the whole globalization issue, what are the takeaways from the World Cup that might end up being applicable to all sports? One I would throw out was just how multicultural it was. John Skipper, who's the president of ESPN, my boss, made a very strategic uh, decision last year. He made a deal with Univision acquiring rights to the Mexican national soccer team. And so we had those matches on ESPN and ESPN2. We decided for the World Cup that we essentially were going to present two national teams, the Mexican national team and the USA national team. The traffic was fairly identical. 
when you went to our website, if the Mexican national team was playing, led the website with a bunch of supporting stories that looked the same as the USA. Totally different way that we programmed from four years before. It reflects changing demographics in this country. It reflects the growth of international football as well as American football. So that one was one big takeaway. The second, which was really enhanced by the time zones because it was in Brazil, was everybody felt like they were a part of the event, especially through their mobile device. And with Watch ESPN, you could stream the games on any device that you had. So those were two things that were radically different in our experience than what we had seen just four years before in South Africa. From my perspective, you know, when we talk about real football, uh, the, <laughs> well, the World Cup... Uh, <laughs> Better be careful here. The, the, the World Cup and what NBC Sports is doing with the English Premier League yes. um, is, again, changing the entire relationship that fans have to that sport, you know, many of them whom, of whom are Hispanic. So being able to watch whatever team, even West Bromwich Albion, because they're streaming every single game live this season, uh, means that my kids see a lot less of me. And that's a good thing for them, and I get to see West Brom, so it's a win-win. <laughs> but again, it, you know, just the ability of these technologies to enable you to see exactly what you want to see, when you want to see it, wherever you happen to be, is, uh, this, um, is the beauty. This February and March, we, we will show every match from the Cricket World Cup which is in Australia and New Zealand. And your first thought is, well, that's, not the, th that's much more of a niche sport. It's not, it's not the World Cup. Yeah, that's uh, what they said about Australian rules football. Uh, football, right? yeah, that's what when they said ESPN about Australian rules football. But it's going to be a huge deal for us. It's going to be incredibly popular. And mobile, the internet, but mobile especially, makes the world a very small place now. Let's talk about games of a different sort. The vice president for Amazon Games was recently quoted as saying, on anything with a screen, games are number one or number two in activity level. The gamification of everything. I mean, I just saw that Microsoft is in talks to buy Minecraft for $1.1 billion. And any of us who have kids and- My six-year-old would say that's a very smart yes, decision. Yes, my son part. would say the same thing, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, wh what's happening in the gaming industry? And, and, there's, and it's twofold. Because I want to get to sort of esports commerce in, 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 a, in a second, but just in terms of games, what, what, what is the, where does the intersection of sports and mobility? So here's a phenomenon. Again, John Skipper was, was at a conference last week, and as he is wont to do, he stirred it up and said, I don't think esports is a sport. And the beauty of the discussion is it really doesn't matter. The one thing that is true is esports is incredibly popular, especially with young men mm -hmm. who are spending hour upon hour watching other people play video games. As a matter of fact, uh, Amazon just outbid Google for a stupendous amount of money to buy Twitch. Right. Sure. So the way we view the world at ESPN is we've created a big tent. And there's plenty of room for everyone who loves American football and international football. But there's also going to be room for people who want to watch other people play video games, whether that's technically defined as a sport or not. The other, other thing that you're seeing is the growth of fantasy games, the development of daily fantasy games. So a couple of panelists have already talked about it. Increasingly, the use of gaming as a defining technique to help grow businesses, that's all at play. Because of the success of our RaceView mobile product, we've had a lot of internal conversations of, well, how do, how do we gamify the experience to the, to the next level where you're actually, instead of watching it, and the good thing about this application is you can literally pinch and zoom, you can get any angle you want. I mean, it's a pretty interactive experience, but you're just watching. So we have all this data. I mean, we're rendering literally billions of data points for every race. How do we put the fan you know, in the car seat? So we have 43 cars on the track. Can we create a 44th virtual car that has your information and you're this kind of ghost car driving along with everybody else in the Daytona 500. That, that is gonna be a reality one day. Um, and that's how we're gonna gamify our sport so we can you know, have that connection with that younger fan base. Because watching is great, but being able to, par to participate is kind of our next step in that. You know, it's gonna be very difficult, but it would be pretty, uh, pretty spectacular. So you're suggesting that the NFL will have a virtual 12th man 
That might be a little harder. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm hold on. Sure. But, but in the NFL, I mean, you, you know how it is. First of all, playbooks right. are gone. Yeah. Playbooks are, is, is on your iPad right now. True. And and the use of, of virtual reality, I, I hate to say this because I'm now kind of, I, it's not like I'm the only person who thought about this, but 10 years ago, I sat with an NFL head coach and I said, I got a crazy idea for you. In this day and age, when players are getting hurt all the time and, and, and you know, practice, you, you, don't, you can't go full out in practice, why not have virtual reality in practice for skill players? Why not put the headset on skill players and for their read and react, whether it's a linebacker, whether it's a running back and you're trying to hit the hole, why not do it virtual reality wise? Because it's not dissimilar to what they do in the Air Force. Right. Can you ever, I mean, you can never even say anymore, this will never happen. Can you envision something like this happen, especially when you want to try to take as few hits as possible in a violent game like football? I can envision some of those things happening in terms of not only putting these. Can we go into business together on this, by the way? What do you think, you and me? Yeah, why not? Why not? I'm not, I'm not, why not? <laughs> Seriously. Why not? But I the could, combines I could, as well, just yeah, having that's, a quantitative that's, evaluation that's of players about. in the combines. That's exactly what I'm thinking about, putting it in in combines, mm -hmm. and not only that, but then being able to truly gauge or evaluate a player's reaction time and his ability and, and, the, and the softness of his hands in terms of catching, mm -hmm. the power in his punches, the power in this tackling ability. You see ESPN doing a lot of these things in terms of the impact and the, the range. Science. Yeah, sports science. Sports right. science stuff. All of that stuff plays a significant role in the decision-making tree of every team, of every owner, of individual players. So it will be there eventually. It is an example, though, where sports is the perfect venue for all of these things. Not the, the only one, but the dish, perfect one. Yeah. Yeah. The great Petri dish. Now, I want to say you brought up Twitch, and according to the New York Times just a few weeks ago, Twitch garnered 55 million unique users in July who watched 155 billion minutes of gaming and has become, has become the country's fourth largest user of internet bandwidth. And those they're watching people? live. <laughs> Andrea, they're watching live. Right. That's what's really, right. that's yeah, what's really important right. and that's why I think it belongs right, under Right, because the you genre. always think of traditional sports as what you, as wow. what you watch live. You know, we, we kind of joked about it a little bit before, but I mean, we're all up here, we're sort of out of the demographic. I mean, we all have kids and everything, but kids are growing up today with the mobile as just you know, an extension of their hands. So when you look at something like this information on Twitch, what does it say about the next generation? It says that they sit at home doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it says. When they should be doing their homework. Yeah. I got two they're teenagers. They're not in school, they're not outside running, they're not doing, they're doing nothing. They're sitting there snacking and just laughing. They're not even playing games. They're, not they're even watching they're people watching All right, let's get rid of games. mobile technology. What do we care? <laughs> No, I mean, you're, you're right about the sociological aspect of it, but yeah. in terms of the business side and the reality side. I mean, the, from the business side, it's interesting because your original question was about the gamification of sports, and what right. we're actually seeing is the sportification of mm -hmm. gaming. Oh, you're right. And they're yeah. effectively right, 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 create, right. turning gaming into this sport that right. millions of people are now watching on their mobile devices. It's you know, we've gone uh, an 35 switch. minutes and hadn't mentioned Twitter which has to fulfill some sort of crazy under over. Mm -hmm. But Twitter has, Twitter has also changed all this stuff utterly. And the way a lot of people find out about things now is through Twitter. Mm -hmm. It's created a totally new relationship that fans have with athletes, that athletes have and their, right. and their ability to get their messages out, talk to their fans, and that's all come through mobile. Right. Right, but there, there's good and, and bad sides of that. I understand as, there's good and bad, the I understand there's good and bad, but it, know, it, it mean, is profound. Right, right. I mean, the, the bottom line is that no professional athlete should ever go out and think any single thing that they do is private. Privacy just... Privacy is gone. Privacy is gone. Privacy is gone. All right, we got a couple quick minutes. Um, the future. What do you think we'll see? What do you want to see? I mean... You talked about being in Cupertino. Are we going to see people watching games on their, on their watches? And, and I'm, I'm throwing a bunch of different things out here. And I guess the one thing I want to start with is, how much longer are we going to be watching sports on television? So we're going to be watching sports on your best available screen forever. These are just screens. And the young audiences think about them as screens. Television is the biggest and best screen, so it's not going away. And, what of I course, rights fees. 
and sports rights fees are not going away. What I find most interesting is that today you've got an addressable audience globally of two billion people who have smartphones with at least rudimentary access to the internet. By the end of this decade, that number is going to be, we believe, between six and seven billion. Mm. So that really changes what's possible in terms of how you serve fans, how you think about the experience. For ESPN, we are going to be on the mobile home screen of every sports fan on the planet. So we think this is a bigger pie. You know, our industry as well as probably everybody's industry, I mean, the, con the consumer is, is, is changing. You know, the traditional consumer, not too long ago, just wanted access to everything. Um, they, want, they would go out and search for it, and, and it had to be there so they could find it. But the new consumer, the connected consumer, the expectations are, are very different. They expect you to be delivering content to them. They're not necessarily going to go out and try to find it. So, you know, how do we as a sport and as a league, you know, create that personalized, customized experience? And then, you know, first of all, we have to know what they want, and then we have to be able to deliver it to them, and then we have to be able to deliver it to them where they are, you know, in the device that they have. So it's, it's challenging, but that is certainly something um, from us, for us and probably everybody that they, we spend a lot of time on thinking about the future. Well, for us, we envision uh, the mobile devices connecting to our smart tags and being able to equip the end user, the fan, the, the purchaser, with information that they're not necessarily getting right now, especially when it comes down to sports memorabilia and collectible space, arts, antiquities, and some of those things. Uh, we feel like that interaction has not taken place over the last 50 years because of holographic in images. People see these things and they think that this is legit and this is real. Well, with the content that we're gathering, the information that we're able to gather, and the processes that we're setting in place to ensure that chain of custody is, is complete, these are the things that people will have access to through their mobile devices. And they'll be able to say, okay, you offer me $500 for this jersey, but I see that there's no history on this jersey, so I'm gonna pass on this. Or I can scan this device and see the history, see the, art, see the chain of custody on it, and understand that this is, was authenticated on this day, this particular place, and this location, but yet, here's the additional content that comes along with it, yes, I'm willing to pay you $1,000 for it and feel good about their purchase and walk away understanding that they bought something that's truly legit and is not being subsidized through some other means. All right, Colin used the words, what the fan wanted. Your, your eyes must have lit up. This is, <laughs> this is, this is what you live for to, to, to re research and, and deliver this information. Yeah, What's I mean, the what, what the fan wants is choice and this is what these devices deliver, and you know, at the end of the day, the fan is looking for the ultimate fan experience for them. And that usually involves what's going on in the big screen, but it also involves uh, having a much more uh, curated selection of content to add value to that main fan experience. And, um, you know, what I'm looking forward to uh, in the future is, is not only being able to find that West Bromwich Albion content, but having my device not only know what that I am a West Brom fan, but what kind of a fan I am and what kind of content I like and don't like, and have them do all the hard work for me so I can just enjoy the ultimate Simon Wardle West Bromwich Albion fan experience. You know, I started off by talking about the final frontier, but the frontier for, for all of this in sports is so open. What's something out there that, that you'd like to see developed, whether it's a programming thing, whether it's an app, whether, I mean, is, is, is there some space out there that's, that's still open that, that you guys can think of would be great to have the void filled? I would love to have everybody have access to, that, to the best seat in the house. So if you watch an NBA game, for instance, you're always wondering what does it actually feel like to be there on the court. Mm -hmm. and, you see, and you see in the case of NFL or NASCAR, the impact of EA gaming and new cameras that take you inside the huddle. Whenever you see, whenever you see a different angle, I was watching the US Open 
and ESPN had some low camera angles of Roger Federer and Djokovic, it looks like a totally different game. Right, the little game. point of view cameras. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not, we'll probably get there through point of view or GoPro cameras or whatever, but I still feel there's another dimension that's possible that could really get you, what does it feel like to be on the sideline? And to both have that venue, to feel the impact, to understand that as great as the TV coverage is, I believe there's more possible. You think there, can you have a, a, that 3D, 4D experience, you think, really? I'm not it's necessarily saying it's 3D, but I'm saying that when Emmett was standing on the sidelines and the defense is on the field, what does it look like from where he's standing? That's different than being on the too high mm -hmm. on the 50 yard line. As a fan, I would love to be able to see that too. It I feels different it. too when I'm on the sideline versus right. when I'm on the field too. Right. Well, right. But but the funny thing is, <laughs> at, you know, from your perspective, but also from my perspective, my years as a sideline reporter, really, when you're on the sidelines, it's kind of the worst seat in the house. I mean, yes. everybody always wonders why the coaches are wired to people above because they can't really see what's right. going on. Right. It's very hard to to see, at least in football, how how it's it's all developing. But I, I just will say this from my perspective, and I've been covering sports for a really long time. Being down on the sidelines of a football game, you really have no idea how hard the hits are, how brutal it can be, things of that nature. And, uh, <laughs> and it's kudos to you that you're still as good as you are at post football. Andrea, I stood on the sidelines of an ESPN Monday night game when I was working with ESPN with Stuart Scott, and I was watching the Baltimore Ravens and the Pittsburgh Steelers. It was one of the most violent games I've ever witnessed before in my entire life. I actually got frightened myself. Mm. I really did. I'm serious. I, I, Stuart Scott, Scott was tripping because I was tripping <laughs> of how hard those boys was hitting out there. So that's a place you really don't want to be. That's a place to scare your kids away from any football contact in the world. <laughs> and, that, and that's when you're happy that you're at home with all your mobile devices. We thank our tremendous panel, all Hall of Famers in their respective areas as far as I'm concerned. Thank you to you for listening.